We'll give a, we'll give a few minutes um, here for people to join. But I'm Scott Galloway. I'm ho I'm in uh, in Boise, and my guest, which we'll do an introduction um, in a little bit, is Dr. Tracy Brower, and she's in Michigan. Exactly. <laughs> at Steelcase headquarters. So we're really we're we're really excited. Um, when we came up, we, we wanted to have a webinar when we found out Tracy could be involved. And um, we really, this is a, the, a topic of what do employees want as they're coming back? And we get asked, you know, we get asked a, a lot of different times a day, you know, when it, when it comes to all of our salespeople who are out in the field, everybody wants to know, hey, what are other organizations doing? to bring people back, what do employees want, what makes them happy. Um, so we were thrilled when we were able to get to, to lock in Tracy to be able to be our, our special guest of honor here. And we'll give, we'll give one more minute and then we'll, then we'll fire away. Yeah, you're right, Scott. This is such a popular topic right now. It seems like it's the question of the hour, question of the day uh, across the nation, across the globe. It's what, what we all want to know. And it's something I, I think is interesting because I was at, I, I, I went to Steelcase headquarters last week and they shared with us, hey, the numbers, here's what the numbers say about return to work. The numbers say corporate America hasn't come back yet. They're, it's onesie twosie. And it's each organization is trying to figure out what their response should be. I mean, a lot of them know that they want to bring people back they're not sure how to do it. And sometimes it's been so long that they're, they're, they're looking for guidance and they're looking to see, hey, what does everybody else do? And so everybody's kind of pausing and occasionally one of them goes, um, you know, kind of like watching people dart across the street in traffic of, of uh, but the, the masses are still waiting there on the sidewalk um, of uh, how, how to bring our people back. And so anyway, a really timely topic and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, uh, to everybody who's joined, and, and we have people joining from um, the Boise area, the Washington area, um, and uh, maybe even elsewhere as, as uh, word got out about this, uh, this special meeting. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the president of OEC. Uh, we're an interiors company in Boise, Idaho, and our mission is to make great spaces where people love to work. And certainly um, our topic today plays into that because space plays a role in, uh, in you know, whether your employees love where they work. It's one of, one, one of, the, uh, one of the facets. Um, Tracy Brower is a oh, PhD um, in, in, in its sociology, correct, Tracy? Um, specifically studying work-life fulfillment and happiness. She's the VP of Workplace Insights for Steelcase and has been there for a number of years. Uh, how long have you been there, Tracy? Five and a half. Five and I've half. been in the industry for 30. Yeah, excellent. Um, in addition, she's the author of several books, um, a couple of those, The Secrets to Happiness at Work and Bring Work to Life, and is also a contributor to Forbes and Fast Company. So it's very likely that almost everybody on the call, if you've done any reading about the, the, the topic of re return to work and you've noticed articles in Forbes, you've noticed articles in Fast Company that you have read um, and come across uh, some of Tracy's work. And uh, her work has been translated into 17 languages. And you can find more about her at tracybrower.com and we'll share that information. Uh, we are recording this session. And so for all of those who are on the call that wanted to like, uh, to hear it again, we'll be sharing the link. If you're registered, you're going to get the link automatically. And then we'll try and grab the link and distribute to those who were registered, but were not able to attend. Uh, we typically put the links to all of our previous sessions on our company events page. Um, so eventually, and Nicole, am I correct? That's eventually where the link to the full recording will end up. So without any other, uh, oh, and a couple other things about the format. So this is a broadcast, a live broadcast. It is live and we are accepting any of your questions. So I've got Nicole here, she's watching the queue. Tracy's watching the queue. You can see Nicole's hand. Uh, Tracy's watching the queue and, and we'll pick up those questions as we go. Um, Tracy has a presentation prepared um, that she'll be going over. And then we're hoping to have 
live engagement as we go and she'll stop and, and feel free to at, at any time to reach out and ask a question. Um, and you can do that with the Q&A section of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Zoom format. So just use the Q&A if you have a question and some of them we may respond just via text. Some of those will respond, we'll take the question live. So without uh, anything else, Tracy, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. Thank you. Awesome, sounds good. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks OEC and Nicole. We super appreciate your partnership and all that you're doing. And it was so great to have you here. I have to tell you all, um, we talk a lot about this topic and it never gets old. There is always new, interesting research to share. There is always new and interesting um, uh, insights and explorations and experiments that we can talk about that are so important to how we all understand this. And I think, you know, what's so interesting is like none of us have it figured out. So it's this really unique moment where we're all looking to each other to learn and kind of live through new experiences. So super thank you for having me and really, really glad you all are here for the learning that we will do together. So um, this is absolutely interesting times. This this will be the most significant reinvention of work in our experience. Like, I always think, you know, three years ago, we might have waked up in the morning and thought, I do, I do cool work. I work in a cool job. I do important things. And we were right. And now we can wake up and think even more about that because our um, world, the people around us, no matter who they are, are thinking so much more consciously. There's so much more awareness about why we work and what we do and with whom and for whom and where and when we work. And so this idea of work and work experience is so much on our radar screens. So it might be different industry by industry or region by region or job by job, but in general, this is going to be absolutely a really significant reinvention. And that gives us an opportunity to reset and rethink and reimagine. Um, and so it's just a, it's a great time to be doing the work that we all are doing. So congratulations to all of us, right? We have done some amazing research. I'm a complete research nerd, uh, but I also think that it gives us evidence on which to make decisions. Um, there's so much risk right now in terms of the decisions that we make and whether people come back and how that goes for us and some of the challenges that we're all facing. And so when we have research and evidence, it's so helpful in us making our decisions. So we will talk about the future of work. We will talk a little bit about what we are seeing and we'll talk about really how do we think about culture and engagement and well-being and the experience that we are building for people. So here are just some things to think about related to future work. What will be that future of work? I just wanna give us a little umbrella and then we'll talk more specifically about some of the research and some of where we go from here in terms of people and their experiences. But this is really gonna be about that dynamic tension between choice and accountability, right? Like really giving people tons of choice and tons of autonomy and knowing that accountability and high performance need to be part of that equation too. And we need to find the right balance and the right mix of those things. So we meet people where they are and we have still great energy and cultures and performance with teams and individuals and organizations. And we need to think about both individuals and organizations, as I mentioned. And I think this is so much about fundamental human needs. Like there are lots of things we can do tactically to bring people back and engage them and help ensure they have a great sense of what they're doing and a great sense of well-being. But in order to address any of those, we need to think about fundamental human needs. And I'll talk about some of what those are and some of how the work experience can address those. But to me, it's almost like we need to talk about all levels of the conversation. We need to talk about, oh my gosh, how do we tactically activate space? How do we design space that compels? How do we design work experiences that address cultural needs? And then how is that really bumped up to the level of humanity and what humans really need? from their work. And leaders have a new challenge. There's a new level of emotional labor that leaders are faced with. And I think too, we have this moment where we're gonna make the best decisions we can right now with what we know, and we're gonna get it wrong. Hopefully we can be directionally accurate even if we get the details wrong, 
but then we need to be ready to measure and monitor and continuously improve. So it's sort of this like start as, as well as we can and give people a sense of stability and the right starting point and then absolutely know that it's going to be evolved and be ready for that evolution over time. So I think that's some of what the future work will be like. So here's a question for you. We have a few polls that we want to get your input on. So I'm going to watch this poll um, and you can answer whenever you're ready. To what extent are you optimistic about the future of work? Greatly bring it on. The best is yet to come. B, it's mixed for me. I can see pros and cons. C, um, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I'm really not sure how it's going to go. Or D, I need another cup of coffee before I answer this one. So go ahead and um, let me know how you're feeling about this one. I think this one's so interesting, right? Like there's this, um, this balance we need to hit between focus on the present and focus on the future, right? Like we can be totally future focused. And sometimes that can give us a sense of ambiguity. It can be a little bit um, disconcerting. It can produce anxiety because we don't know what to expect. Or we can be so focused in the present that we can not move forward enough and not be imaginative enough or hopeful enough. And so it's this balance of how optimistic am I and how real am I and how do we get the right balance of those. So great. Um, let me share the results with you. 29% of you are say, bring it on. 64, it's mixed, como si, como sa, or 7%, uh, maybe a little pessimistic. So super appreciate you all sharing. I think wherever we are is the right starting point. Like we all start in a different place and we need all kinds of thinking about where we're going and how good it's going to be or not in order to move forward together. So super appreciate it. Thanks, you all. So I'm going to close this and keep us moving. So here's something else about hybrid. The popular press loves to aggrandize, as we know. And I think what they've done is really created this false contradiction that it's an either or debate, right? All remote, remote work is best, away from the office is best, or no, no, it's all about the office. The office is everything. And really the magic of hybrid, the magic of all we've learned is that it's a both and solution, that we absolutely can give ourselves back more time and quality of life and choice and kind of liberation from the traditional work environment when we're working away from the office. And the office has so much to deliver. Um, there was a brand new article in the New York Times. Um, it was published on September 8th. And it was all about how the open office is terrible and it's evil and it's, you know, one of Dante's rings of hell. And uh, it's just so interesting, right? Because it was so extreme. And we know that there's brilliant research about how the office motivates us, gives us a sense of purpose, gives us a sense of connection, helps us to be productive, particularly around complex tasks or problem solving tasks. All of that research is absolutely available. And we can have um, places where we can do good work away from the office. And so depending on our work. So I think this either or debate is limiting and we can move ourselves definitely to a both and conversation. So here's some interesting stuff. 21% of people say they would be really happy to work from the office. 34% are kind of undecided voters. Hmm, I don't know, where do I want to be? And 45% of people say, no, I'm happy to keep working from home. And those are the people who say, I'm happy to work from home if I'm going back to the other, the thing that I knew before the pandemic. So we have this wonderful opportunity to compel people back, to create places that are different than what they used to be because work has changed, work experience has changed as well. So we have the 45% that we can recreate, renew, refresh. And we have the 34% who say, you know, I'm pretty neutral. And of course the 21% are the ones that are saying, I'll help you create that future and we can do it together. Most people expect to spend some time in the office. And it's actually a misnomer that people only want to work from home. That's another thing that's been aggrandized in the popular press. But if you look at the data, many, many people want some time in the office for all the reasons that I talked about before. So that's pretty cool for us because we can create great work experiences that really matter in the human experience. 
So here's a little bit more about the trends that we're seeing. There is a very, very significant trend toward organizations that are going to a 3-2 model or a 2-3 model. That's just really, really prevalent. Um, and we're seeing organizations do lots of piloting. Our data suggests that between 93 and 94% of companies are doing some kind of piloting. So we've got lots of data about what we know people want, and spaces and optimal spaces. But lots of companies are saying, you know, we got to figure this out for ourselves. We need to experiment. We need to try. We need to tinker. And we want participation. And the thing that I think is such an opportunity here is that when we experiment with our space, we send a message that we're learning and experimental and exploratory as a culture. And we send a message if we ask for people's input on those pilots about what, what they think. And we send a message that we're listening. We send a message that the voice of the employees matters. And so it's kind of a um, means to an end, right? We get input and then we get great work experiences because we listen to the input and we continuously improve. But it's also an end in and of itself. Asking for that participation, doing those experiments, sends some really important messages about what we value. So those are some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of how people are starting to figure it out and how they are exploring and experimenting. So here's another question for you from a poll standpoint. So let me pull this down and we'll go to the next one. So the question is, to what extent do you believe people want to work in the office? So what's your opinion on this? Might be your organization, might be your client organization, might be your perspectives based on the neighbors that you talk to. Um, totally, they can't wait to get back. Be somewhat, depending on many factors. C, not at all. Most people want to work from home going forward. Or D, I can't comment work-wise, but virtual yoga class just isn't the same. So super curious about what you all think. Really interesting. We've been, um, there are some dashboards online that you can find that are these giant accountings of all the organizations, all the organizations, all major organizations, and what they're doing in terms of their hybrid strategies. Um, and we can, uh, we can send you a link as a follow-up or you can follow up with us and we can give it to you. But super interesting. It lists, literally lists and then the other thing that I think is interesting is if you do a search on Google Trends, we can send you a link for this too if you're interested, you can see where people are doing the most searches for things like hybrid work or remote work or working in the office. And so you can kind of start to see how things are coming together and what people really want and what people are really being offered. That is the interesting dynamic is um, where are we seeing people with new demands and in what ways are organizations meeting those demands. So 7% of you, totally, they can't wait to go back. Huge majority of you, right, saying somewhat, depending on a lot of factors. And some of you are saying not at all. They are uh, absolutely ready to, uh, ready to keep working from home. So super appreciate that, you all. This is interesting generationally, too. I just did an article for Forbes on generations. And um, one of the things that we see, again, in the popular press is all the Gen Zs who want to continue working from home and never report to an office again. But we're actually not seeing that as much. We're seeing a mix of um, the younger people at younger life stages want to build their career and build social capital and build visibility. And so they're very happy to be in an office and learning from others. Mid-stage um, life stage, a lot of times people want an office because they just need to get in, get out, get their work done, move on to the thousand other things in their life as a sandwich generation. And a lot of times um, later stage people are um, wanting to uh, come to the office so that they can leave a legacy, be part of organizational memory, um, really be part of mentoring others. So we all care about all those things. Crazy. We might have different priority order of them depending on our life stage. So um, whether people want to work in the office can be dependent on lots and lots of factors. So super appreciate your point of view on that, you all. Tracy, quick question for you. This is Scott. Yeah. Um, you said a later stage. Uh, does that include uh, Generation X? Um, uh, is that is that part of that, or are they are the more yeah. of a part? I'm so glad you asked. 
So gener when we look at generations, a lot of times we end up um, over generalizing. Gen Z thinks this, millennials think this, you know, Xers are this, and boomers are that, and um, silent generation or something else. A lot of times life stage is actually a more credible way to look at what people want. So early life stage is probably like Z's and early millennials, right? Maybe no kids yet, maybe no partner yet, maybe just, you know, with a partner and free and easy, right? Less of the um, requirements of life kind of um, uh, uh, on their shoulders. Mid-stage, people often are married, they often are, you know, having kids, they often have elders they're taking care of, right? Not every single person, but a lot of times that's kind of mid-stage. And then later stage is often, you know, empty nest and um, other things uh, sort of moving on in life and, and all of that kind of thing, more senior in careers. So I love your question, Scott. I think a lot of times that life stage is actually more salient for some of those differences. I just heard an article on this topic, and one of the things that the data says is that there are less um, significant differences in what people want based on age than what you would think. And so life stage ends up being um, a really great way to think about that. Any other questions coming up right now, Scott? I think that's the only one we've had so far. And oh, audience, yeah. feel, free to, feel free to use that Q&A if you do have questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for moderating us. Super appreciate it. All right, you all, here's something else about the future of work that I think is so relevant for us. And that is we need critical mass as we think about the work experience. One aspect of critical mass is how do we have cities where enough organizations are asking people to come back enough of the time that we get critical mass for the city? We have mass transit, we have electricity, we have restaurants that can be open for lunch times because there's enough people around. There's safety because there's multi-use of, um, of that downtown area. Another aspect of critical mass is leaders who say that people want to come back, need to come back. Scott, I loved your analogy at the beginning of the call where you said, oh my gosh, you know, like some leaders are requiring people to come back and it's kind of like we're watching them run across a busy street and go, oh, how does that go for that person? Um, we have one customer, super interesting. They are in a, a relatively large market, probably about the same as you all. And they have a few major employers in the area who are starting to work together, they're not competitors, but they're working together to say, what are we going to require and how do we think about the employee experience in our market and we have um, enough of us saying similar things that we can start to really build critical mass around people returning to the office for the right amount of time. And then within workplaces matters as well, right? Like the reason to come to the office is because you have great space and you can get your work done brilliantly and build social capital and mentor others, but also you want to be around your people, you want to connect. And so how do we have that critical mass within workplaces that will bring us back? I think those are three really interesting ways to think about critical mass right now. So what are the things that will bring people back? Our data suggests that there are conceptually a few things that people really want and that really matter. If we can invest in 100 things, what are the three that matter most to compel people back? And one of those is stimulation and inspiration. Like for those of us who've been able to work from home, right? We love our fuzzy slippers. We love our little dog that laying by our feet. But our worlds have gotten a lot smaller. And so people want a boundary from home. Um, they want stimulation and inspiration, um, which comes from cool environments, which comes from getting out, which comes from interacting with others who have new ideas and new perspectives. They also want connections. Like, this is really interesting stuff. 75% of people say they make their friends at work. 81% of people say they make their more diverse friends at work. And so we want those connections with other people. The incidence of depression, anxiety, um, mental health challenges has increased exponentially and ubiquitously in the last three years. 
And that is 100% correlated with distance from each other, less interaction points, less time together, rolling up sleeves and doing good work together. And absolutely, we can do great work virtually as well. And those face-to-face -face connections one way or the other also end up being really important to people. And they say that that's something they want. The other thing people want is access to leaders. Um, we know from our research that when leaders are more present and accessible, cultures tend to deliver better results. They tend to be more fulfilling for people. And so people say, you know what, if I get those three things, I'm more engaged, I'm more likely to stay with the organization, I'm 9% more productive, and um, I also am um, feeling more connected to the culture. So we can say to ourselves, huh, if I make this investment, will it really pay off? And the answer is, yeah, actually, people are saying it will pay off in terms of them being much more compelled by that work experience. So we've got a great opportunity. I think this is the other thing that's worth talking about. And that is that, you know, we've reduced friction in so many parts of our life, right? Like we've got more conveniences than we had. I don't go to Target anymore. I get a shipment from Target when I need stuff. I don't go to the dry cleaner. I have my dry cleaning picked up and dropped off on Tuesdays and Fridays. I don't even have to talk to the barista. I just order stuff on my app and run through the drive-thru with, with barely a nod, right? Um, a friendly nod for sure. But we've removed all this friction from our lives. But superficial connections, that chat with the dry cleaning person or that chat with the barista actually correlate significantly with a feeling of happiness. So if we've reduced all of those moments of interaction in our society, work ends up being a really important place that we have those connections. And work is really good for making connections because we see each other usually over, over time, right? Like even if we're going to from one job to another every couple of years, we're still sort of working with people over time, any, any job at a time that we're doing. We tend to see people both um, doing tasks, we're rolling up sleeves, we're working on the thing for the customer, we're working on the thing for the project, and we tend to see each other in relational situations, right? Like I get to check out, check in and say, how was your, how was your game that you went to? How's your child? How's that move you're going through? And we tend to see people in kind of good days and bad days, right? We see each other enough that there can be those moments where we see ups and downs. And that diversity of experience with each other tends to build relationships. So work is a really important part of our lives and our worlds. And organizations and companies have so much to do in the world right now in terms of linking each other up and helping us to feel those levels of relationship that are so important to us, even if they're just superficially running into somebody at the coffee machine. So we've got a really important role to play. So here's another question for you. Super curious about your point of view on this one. Um, this one's all about community and connections. So to what extent do you believe it's challenging to create community and connection in a hybrid model? A, challenging? No, it's easy as pie. B, somewhat, there are pros and cons. C, honestly, it's really different and it's tough. Or D, just a minute, I need to focus or check with my people on this one. So I'm curious what you all think about this one. Um, this is one of those things, right? Like we can absolutely develop relationships with each other from a distance and thank you to technology for keeping us connected all these years together. And there's something about face-to-face -face as well. So really interested in what you all think about this one. Looks like most of you have responded. So sharing the results, 13% um, of you are saying, no, nah, easy, no problem. 47%, somewhat, there are pros and cons. And then 40%, it's difficult. Yeah, this is really interesting. Um, sociologically speaking, proximity is the number one determinant of relationship. When we see each other more, we just tend to build relationships with each, with each other. 
And sociologically speaking, when we see each other more, when there's greater familiarity, we tend to have greater acceptance as well. We just kind of start to get each other, right? Like we have more data and information. And so we don't um, jump to conclusions about each other. Like if you walk in in the morning and you've got a scowl on your face and I don't know anything about you, I might think, oh, that person's aloof or, or um, I don't know, maybe that person doesn't like me or maybe there's something bad going on that I should know about. But if I know more about you, if I have just that little bit more familiarity and data, I might know you got a new puppy and maybe you didn't sleep very much last night. And so um, familiarity tends to breed acceptance. And that is true of people and all kinds of other things, food and art and you name it. Um, and so there's something about seeing each other, being in contact regularly, either virtually or physically, that really help us to cement connections and community. So love what you all are saying. That's great. All right. So we talked about um, conceptually, what do people want? Stimulation and inspiration, connection and leadership. Now, how do we bring that down a level to place? This is what people say they want from their workplaces. So lots of people say, I want space for hybrid collaboration. Um, and that's understandable, right? If I'm gonna do my video conference from home or my video conference in the office, how is it better in the office? How is that gonna earn my commute? So that could be about acoustics or it could be about display or it could be about technology or it could be about being able to run into people between the video conferences. But those spaces for hybrid collaboration are number one. And then it is a misnomer that everybody is going to focus at home and collaborate in the office because that's generally not the way the work flows. Usually our um, focus time and our collaborative time blend together. I might have a meeting and then I'm going to um, grab some time you know, to do some focused work and then I might have a prep time and then I might have another collaborative moment. Um, and so people say they really want focused space in the office. They want the opportunity for privacy. They want to be able to close a door, even if it's not their own, even if it's an enclave that they're using on a temporary basis. So they want that focus and collabor or, uh, privacy. The other thing people say they want is reservable workspaces. This has to do with our um, neurological preference for predictability. Humans tend to avoid ambiguity. And what that looks like is when I come into the office, I don't want to go on walkabout with my briefcase looking for a place to be. I want to be able to reserve a space so there's some predictability and some efficiency and some convenience that I can kind of predict where I'm going to be for different meetings during the day. People also want flexibility, right? Like at home, we've been able to move stuff around, move from room to room, adjust our, I don't know, volume, lighting. Um, we can move from our couch to our island, to our home office if we have a home office. Um, and so people want that flexibility of furniture in the space as well. And they want the flexibility to move from place to place. And of course, this is no surprise, what they wanted before the pandemic was more conference rooms. What they want after the pandemic is more conference rooms. So that's a that's a tried and true that we can uh, we can be sure about as well. And this is interesting, right? I always say we don't just have to run faster than the bear; we have to run faster than the other guy. The bear is also chasing. So uh, with that, I guess that's not very collaborative of me, is it? But this is what other companies are doing, right? So to the extent that place is a differentiator to the extent that work experience absolutely matters to people when they join an organization, when they choose to stay at an organization, you want to know what everybody else is doing. And so lots of organizations are adding ancillary space so that it's that sort of comfy home feeling so that people can connect serendipitously. Organizations are proportionally adding more collaborative space. At the same time, they're maintaining space for focus tech upgrades are absolutely on the menu, and more companies are doing more unassigned workstations. And this is really interesting. The bigger organizations are more likely to be shifting to um, more unassigned workstations. So there's a size differential there as well in general. So interesting to know what other people are doing. So I talked at the beginning about fundamental human needs. And these are some of the things that I just think are super interesting about human beings. We have a fundamental human need for belonging. 
when we feel a sense of belonging, we feel a greater level of psychological safety. When we have a sense of belonging, we feel connected to the group in a way that allows us to take risks, do our best work, feel more fulfilled. And so that's really good for people. It's also really good for organizations and bottom lines. We get that significantly when we're in the office. We get that significantly when we think about something like a neighborhood, right? Like I may not have a dedicated workstation, but I have a dedicated place I can go in a neighborhood to find my people. Um, it's not the only way to get belonging. Certainly, we can get belonging from lots of other um, applications and settings and design solutions, but belonging is fundamentally one of those things people need. The other thing that I think is so interesting is territory, right? Like, like I need a place for myself. I need to know that I have a place. This is also about a space for my stuff. So like I need a place where I can be, but gosh, even a locker or a shelf or a storage um, unit can help in terms of me feeling like there's a place for me. And so that is a need for territory that's sort of fundamental. The other thing I talked about is predictability, right? Like we want a certain amount of stimulation and inspiration as humans, but we also shy away from ambiguity. We shy away from unpredictability. And so when we have that sense of, I know where I'm gonna work today. I know what I can count on for my space. I know what I can count on in terms of what's available in terms of technology. Those are things that are really helpful. And this is a big one we haven't talked about yet. People want to feel a sense that they matter. And so this is about um, line of sight, right? Like when I'm in the office, I'm reminded that my work affects his work and her work and their work and finally our end customer, that there's a continuity from my work out to the end customer and what we're doing as an organization. Um, there's a certain amount of emotional contagion that I don't know if I can use the word contagion anymore. There's a certain amount of um, sort of social uh, emotion that we share when we're together. It's called the bandwagon effect. And so we tend to pick up from others. And what that means is it's about mattering, right? Like we all showed up together here because we have a common purpose in the big picture. And so that is extraordinarily motivating for people. And so being together, we can do that virtually, we can do that in person is a very big deal to people feeling like they matter to their work feeling like it makes a difference. So here's another question for you. Um, we are going to talk on um, this one about the extent to which your clients are reinventing the workplace. A, totally everything is changing. B, a little bit over time and as we learn more. C, not so much. The focus is on other things right now. Or D, I prefer not to answer. I'll just say that I've been making the case. So go ahead and let us know how much are the people, organizations, clients that you know making shifts in their work experience, making shifts in their workplace, reinventing. I always love the concept of you can tell when an organization has been designed by smart people who care. Isn't that cool? So any good sociologist can put that on a two by two. And so you think about smart people can be on the vertical axis, right? Like how much do I really know about great workplaces and how to create them? And who care that can be on the horizontal axis? Um, how much am I willing to invest in a great place for people? And you can absolutely tell when something is designed by smart people who care, right? We really understood what was necessary. We were empathetic to users and we made an investment. I love that. Uh, I love that model. And I think it's so apt in terms of how we think about reinventing the workplace. So look at this. If we turn this on its side, it's a perfect normal distribution. That's your research geek speaking. 7% um, of you say everything's changing. 80% of you, a little bit as we learn more over time and see 13% um, of you, not so much. So super appreciate it. That's so interesting, right? I think this makes a difference. We can reinvent the workplace because it's the right thing to do. We can reinvent the workplace because work has changed. Therefore, the work experience needs to change. 
And when we do, we send such a message to people, right? Like we send a message that we're listening. We send a message that we realize things have turned upside down um, and we're absolutely willing to make that investment and demonstrate that we're moving forward. Do we have a question? Yeah, um, and this is, uh, Tracy, this is a question from me. Um, we've had this big event uh, that leadership has been dealing with called the Great Resignation. Um, and we've also had a new thing called quiet quitting. Uh, there, as you've talked about these things that humans need in the workplace, they want in the workplace, do you think that the lack of, of these items in the workplace is one of the main reasons for all the churn in kind of everybody's industry right now? Yeah, I think this has tons to do with it. And I think this is such a moment, right? I wrote an article not too long ago about like the power shift that's occurring, right? Like we went to this place where employees had incredible amounts of power, right? Because um, it was such a tight labor market. And now as the economy is contracting, and as we're seeing more headlines about layoffs, we're starting to maybe see a little shift in power back toward companies versus um, employees. So I think that's going to be interesting. Like, will we feel like um, organizations are going to take a stronger stand in bringing people back when they're when the labor market is less tight? But labor market continues to be tight, even with the tightening of the economy. That's one of the economic paradoxes that's going on right now. And I think the great resignation. I like to call it the talent revolution, is the best evidence that what we have been doing is not working perfectly. And this is really interesting. There's some data that 61% of people have buyer's remorse. They make a change to a different job and 61% of people are like, oh shoot, I don't know if that was the right thing to do. I might've thought the grass was greener and maybe it's not really greener. And so I absolutely believe that this is our moment to figure out what were we not doing brilliantly in terms of all aspects of the work experience, right? Culture, process, tools, space, and how can we improve it? And quiet quitting is so interesting, right? That term is so sticky. It's just like, it's everywhere. It's just so interesting to me which terms take off. But I think Quiet quitting in some ways is like a rebrand of um, us rejecting hustle culture, which is great, right? Like we need um, moments when we are uh, feeling like, um, like we can relax, where we don't have to hustle, where we don't have to like um, run so hard because we're never good enough, right? That's super healthy to realize that we don't need that hustle culture. And it's a really healthy thing when we stretch and develop and grow. That is utterly correlated with happiness. The other problem with quiet quitting is if it's a passive aggressive maneuver and I'm letting my coworkers down, that's less helpful. And I think actually loud resignations are the um, alternative. I was thinking about writing an article on it, but I held myself back, right? Like if we're unhappy, let's empower ourselves to speak up so that the people around us can, um, can uh, create the conditions differently so that we can empower ourselves to make different choices and create the conditions for our own happiness. So I really like the idea of loud resignations or, you know, speaking up and being assertive about what we need and then creating that for ourselves and for others. So I love your question, Scott. You're making me think I gotta, I gotta think even more about those. Any other questions at the moment? Uh, let's check. I'm getting the thumbs up from Nicole that we're good. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for asking. I super appreciate it. All right, you all, I just want to finish us out and talk a minute about space and how this all comes together. Um, so the power of neighborhoods is pretty cool, right? Because it helps us breed the physical and the digital where the tech and space come together. It really helps us to find the balance between me and we, what I need, what you need, the open and enclosed, and really helps us move fluidly from space to space. 
So I always like eye candy. This is the uh, picture tells a thousand words, right? But I like really like this. Um, you've got people working independently, individually. They can flow over to, oh my gosh, let's talk about this customer thing we need to talk about on the upper right. You can do some work with virtual folks. The nice thing in this environment, right, is this might be a team specific environment and we're overhearing each other if we want to, we're using headphones if we want to, but the ambient environment allows me to listen and learn from people around me and I can kind of check in on those conversations or I can check out on those conversations and I can pay attention to what matters to me. This is so cool, right? These are tents that we've um, been using. And uh, the cool thing here is with these tents, they give you such a sense of place. They're not giving you acoustical privacy or um, visual privacy. And so the magic of a tent, I think is just so interesting because it still gives you that sense of place and you can come together with others. You can feel like you can get away on your own. This is nice because it shows the, um, importance of some of those enclaves that are closely placed to work areas, right? Like I've got to get away from my video call. I got to get away from my private conversation with the doctor or the school or whatever. And when those are in close proximity, that makes a big difference. We worked with an IT group who said, oh, we're all introverts. We're all, we're very introverted. We're a highly introverted group. And um, we opened up their space significantly and they implemented neighborhoods. And one of the things we did is put tons of enclaves around their um, perimeter. And they, in their feedback said, we feel like we've got so much more privacy. And the interesting thing is the panel heights had gone down and the, the, there was less um, boundary between the spaces in the open areas, but they literally felt like they had more privacy, ironically, because they had more of those places that they could go when they really needed both acoustic, when they needed acoustical privacy. They didn't need visual privacy in this case. So I like this flow as well. And then outdoor spaces are incredibly popular. It's amazing how many of the uh, winter weather states or cold weather states are implementing outdoor spaces for those nicer seasons. But this is, you know, biophilia at its best is real nature, right? And so we're seeing tons of a trend toward outdoor spaces. And we have some typologies, right? Unassigned team spaces are a really big part of what we're seeing, how all of this comes together. If I need belonging, I wanna go to a team space. I may not need dedicated space because that's not the trend for lots of organizations, but I really like going to a team space or a social garden where I can, you know, go and connect with my coworker informally, where the posture is informal, that it kind of um, sends a message about our trust of each other or our ability to kind of um, kick back together and have a really meaningful conversation about that customer challenge we're going through. Um, we need enclosed spaces. Here's something interesting. Our data before the pandemic suggested that lots of conference rooms were really big with only a couple of people using them, right? You saw that data backward and forward. That is even more the case today because most meetings will have at least one remote participant. So all of a sudden you don't need that 12 person conference room anymore because four of the people are remote anyway. So we're still seeing this contraction to mid-size and smaller size conference rooms, especially because of that remote participant element. Lots of open collaborative space because again, people want to connect even when they still need places for focus. And of course they need those focus rooms. Um, and people a lot of times still want assigned homes depending on the, um, uh, the way the team works together and the extent to which people tend to be more heads down and focused in their work. So what works is we talked about piloting and participation. We want to inspire people's curiosity, right? Ask for their feedback and give them something new because it's the right thing to do because work has changed and because we want to inspire them to um, be curious and feel that healthy sense of FOMO, right? Like everybody, everybody seems to be in the office. I don't want to miss out on that. So, um, so we talked about those considerations for the future of work. It will be about balancing all of these kinds of things. It will be about building better places and creating great work experiences. So with that, I am going to turn it back to Scott and Nicole, and we can uh, take some questions and see what you all are thinking as well. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Tracy. There is so much information there that I know you, you uh, as a, uh, a, an, an information nerd or a uh, researcher is what <laughs> you think, that I know you could go into a lot of detail on each one of those slides. Uh, maybe as a take home message, uh, this is really great information on what people are looking for. Um, for those that are looking for how, how do we share this information with leadership, with those in decision making um, influences, how do we, you know, is there any way that you recommend that we go about sharing this information with those yeah. Key, with those key people. I mean, how do we get them engaged in these kinds of conversations? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Scott. That is not a question people ask very often. I really, really like that. I mean, I'm at a tactical level. I'm so happy to share the deck and I'll share some follow-up articles. I think it's really about intentionality. Like to me, that's a really big takeaway message. And so we can share uh, data about what people want we can share implications for the space, and we can share why that's important in terms of the business outcomes. And all of that stuff is in the back, it's in articles, all that kind of thing. I think the best way to share is in conversations with people, right? Small groups, large groups, whatever, so that we can push back, so that we can learn together. And I also think there's a lot of value in a trickle message, right? Like when we're trying to make the case, we're going to have a deck that's the business case for the direction we want to go. And I think we can trickle information to people. Hey, I saw this cool article on this. Hey, I saw this today. Hey, here's, you know, Steelcase's global report with the data. If we reinforce the message, I think that makes a big difference because humans tend to learn and tend to be um, persuaded with a planned redundancy of messaging. You probably won't persuade me or educate me very well if you hit me with something once, but over time, that, um, that reinforcement, that validation, that redundancy is a really good thing. So I gave you a little bit of information there about what to share and maybe a little yeah. bit of to share. Yeah, that was great. Um, so we'll open it up and we want to make sure everyone gets off uh, for, for lunch here. It's almost noon here. So we'll open it up. If you have any questions, use that Q&A. Um, we had a question come in of, of the spaces that can be re redesigned, which one would be the most important? So do you care to opine? And, and I know there was a slide, I just can't remember what, what percentages were, were, were where, but is there a space that you might recommend that we put some extra focus on? Yeah, absolutely. Two, actually, I think neighborhoods, 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 like I just think the neighborhoods are such a compromise, right? It's not dedicated workspace to an individual, but it's to a team. So you get all those things, you get belonging, you get the territory, you get predictability. So let's design some neighborhoods for teams and for groups, so they can find each other and get work done really, really effectively. The other thing that I think makes tons of sense to put some effort into is community spaces, you know, like, the work cafe or the social garden, like where are the places that people are gonna to come together and connect? They still need their enclaves for sure. But if a really big part of what's bringing people back is that um, desire to connect with others, that critical mass, I think those community spaces are gonna be really important. And those might be ancillary spaces, which to your point are a really big place where um, customers are making investments. And when you talk about neighborhoods, are we talking about collections of employees that have related or interrelated work, like maybe departments um, or you know related departments. Is that what you mean by neighborhoods? Yeah, I think we can think about a neighborhood a couple of different ways. Like like some organizations are using neighborhoods for cross functional teams, right? Like I might have a neighborhood for a new product development team, and I've got people from marketing and people from engineering and people from sales and people from, um, I don't know, finance that are all part of that particular neighborhood because they're working on developing or launching that particular product. Or we can think about neighborhoods attributed to a department, right? So I might have a neighborhood for the um, for a particular part of my IT group that's working on the new um, customer interface. Or I might have a neighborhood for the team that's working on social media within our marketing organization in total. So those neighborhoods would be specific to the kinds of work that we're doing. Um, and those might be departmental and they might be interdepartmental. Okay, so we have a couple questions. Um, 
One is, can you, can you further discuss the types of flexible spaces your research has shown is effective in bringing people back to the office? And are these simple replication of the types of spaces one might find in their home, for example, living room with flexible seating or other? Interesting. Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, I think the thing that we're really seeing in terms of flexible spaces is spaces that are multimodal. So like some of those images I showed, right? You've got display screens, you can do a presentation in those spaces, or you've got comfy seating, you can do a, I don't know, you can do a one-on-one -on -one meeting, or you can do a coaching session. Um, you could do learning in those spaces. So they're multimodal, so they have flexibility that way. The other thing that we've seen that's working really well from a flexibility standpoint is in a neighborhood, you might have quote unquote lot lines, which separate the spaces, right? Like one neighborhood is separated from another or another. And you might have vertical dividers that are like an acoustical vertical divider. And you can pull those apart. So maybe the whole department is gonna be in and you need space for the whole department to come together. You pull those apart. Or when the whole department isn't there, you maintain those flat lines with those vertical dividers. And so that gives you some flexibility as well. And I think the point about home coming to the office is spot on, right? Like we want the office to feel really comfortable. Work has gone home. And so now people are saying they want home to come to work. And so it's kind of like what we were seeing before the pandemic, maybe even on steroids, right? So it's that sense of comfort and control that we know are really high priorities for people. So it's a great question. Thank you, and I've got one more here. Um, have you seen a difference between more rural areas versus larger cities in getting their workforce back to the office? Yeah, this is so interesting. I was literally just having this conversation the other day. The bigger the city, the harder time they are getting people back. And it seems to have everything to do with mass transit, commute times, um, the experience of the city where it's like hustle bustle and I can't, you know, I can't find a place to have lunch and I got to stand in line at the food truck and I got to ride the subway. And, and the thing that's related to that is quality of life, right? If I'm in a rural area and I have a 15 minute commute, coming to the office doesn't steal time from my family, my workout, my, I don't know, time to make healthy dinners. But if I'm in a city and my commute time is an hour, hour and a half each way, that is a big difference in terms of the opportunity cost in life. So we're definitely seeing a correlation to city size. So it's a great question. Well, we'll, uh, we'll just do one more question. This is an easy one. Um, where do people go to get more information if they're interested in, in reading more about your research and the things that you're talking and writing about? Where can they go to, to, to gather that up in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. They should go to your website. You're, uh, you have amazing information. Definitely come to you first. Um, and steelcase.com has tons and tons of this information. I also have um, on my own website, tracybrower.com, I've got all my publications and then some um, like uh, groupings of publications. So if you're particularly interested in the topic of hybrid work or return to the office, so lots of opportunity there and you and Steelcase are the best first places to go. Well, thank you so much, Tracy, for joining us. And thank you for everybody who participated. And we'll make the, again, we'll make the recording of this available to everybody who registered. And uh, we'll also make the link available to everyone who didn't register uh, on our events page. Um, probably, Nicole, would you say in the next few days? Um, so you can share this with um, colleagues, uh, coworkers, leadership, whoever. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Have a, yeah, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.